Okay, tonight's topic is the origins of language. Um, why does it matter that we crack this puzzle, this problem? Um, as we move around in our environment, um, parts of it don't talk to us. So the trees, the rocks, the animals, the sun. I mean, you know, we can find out what's going on, we can interact, but they don't actually speak to us in our own language. And other parts, of course, do speak to us. And that huge difference is responsible, or at least is a large part of the reason for this massive crack, really, um, disjuncture or separation in human knowledge. We've got, on the one hand, all the people that study parts of the universe that don't talk to us, they're called natural scientists. And then we've got all the humanities and historians and social scientists people who talk to people, either people who are still alive or read, read the documents to find out what people were doing in the past. So this, the result is that we have a, a two cultures, is one way of putting it, of course, but our, our picture of the world is, is, is like a crack mirror. We haven't put it together. Um, and I can't see really any way of putting it together if we can't explain scientifically how it is that the parts of nature that don't talk to us over evolutionary time began talking. So what other way would there be of putting the big picture together than cracking the problem of the evolutionary emergence of language? I often find that people think there's not much of a problem there. It's kind of easy. It must be easy. We're, we're all Darwinians now. All educated people understand that complex structures in, on this living planet of ours have evolved through natural selection. So surely, um, language must have evolved like everything else, like our fingers, like the like, bipedalism, like, like the eyes. We, we know that that's how things evolve. Um, so <clears throat> why is it that this seems to be an exception? And I really want to stress this. Um, It's regarded as the hardest problem in science. I mean, there may be one or two other very hard problems. Consciousness is, is one of them. But, but the people who've been studying this question are now beginning to think that it's, it is really very hard. Um, and um, I've been involved since 1996. In 1996, I helped organize the first Evo Lang conference uh, with uh, Jim Herford, a professor of linguistics at uh, Edinburgh University. And um, over the years, we've been publishing, we've been holding conferences every two years. And these have been the main international conferences addressing this, this problem. And over the years, we've been pub <laughs> publishing all these volumes, the prehistory of language, the cradle of language. Um, the evolution emergence of language, approaches to the evolution, and then just recently with, with um, Dan Dorn and Jerome Lewis, uh, the social origins of language. So we've had 20 years, um, and, and I, I say 20 years because it was around that time, the early 90s, where kind of the dam broke. Perhaps I should explain that the whole topic of the origin of language had been regarded as so difficult, so kind of impossible, so frustrating, and in a way pointless, therefore, um, that had been pretty much tabooed throughout the 20th century. Uh, the, the, in 1866, the Paris Linguistic Society, and Paris was then one of the great centers of linguistics, um, was founded, and in its statutes, it said no papers will be accepted on two topics. One of them, the search for universal language, and the other, any paper on the origins of language would be, wouldn't be considered. And that, that ban on the topic um, pretty much survived throughout most of the 20th century. I mean, there were one or two exceptions, but it, kind of, it, was never, it was never considered sensible, scientifically respectable to address that uh, topic. Um, until, there well, were one or two events, I won't go into the details, but in, really in the 19, in 1990 was probably the year when the, the dam began to break. We had two we had a, a rather amazing book um, by uh, Derek Bickerton, um, Language and Species, on that very subject, and, and by the way, Derek Bickerton was just saying, it's just so strange that almost every other branch of science has a historical dimension. Physicists are, in, are interested in the origins of the universe, the origins of the galaxies, 
geologists are interested in the origins of planet Earth, and historians are interested in, you know, in the past. And why is it that linguistics is the exception? Why is it that somehow this subject, we, we, we were only allowed to study language like synchronously, in other words, now as it is, instead of looking at how it might have evolved? But I will say that, uh, yes, the dam broke, and I'm happy to say I was a part of all that. Um, we, we set up this, it was almost unprecedented to have a, a conference, a, a regular international conference dedicated to this topic. It was very successful, um, and over the years we've been producing <laughs> all these volumes, but I have to admit that after, after 20 years we are no nearer um, agreement um, than we were 20 years ago. It's, it's, and it, it is, it is ex really a strangely acrimonious field. I'm not going to talk too much about Chomsky today, but, it, but it is, there's, more, there's more blood on the carpet, if you like, around this topic than pretty much any other, any other um, academic um, topic. No to I could say no topic has been more riven with dissension, bitter disputes, um, people you know, accusing each other of, of chicanery, deception, people... You know, losing their jobs over it, and so on and so, on and so forth, than this topic. Um, so, um, as I say, you, you might think it's easy, and a lot of people who aren't, haven't encountered this problem think, well, surely Darwin had an answer, and indeed, the, the, Charles Darwin himself did. Darwin's theory was very simple, it was that man is a very intelligent creature, uh, he's more intelligent than chimpanzees, and as intelligence grew, as intelligence increased, naturally um, the evolving ape, evolving to become human, found a way of imitating the cries of animals um, and, and increasingly uh, developing complex communication eventually into, you know, through the, the culminating in, in language as we know it. And that theory has its supporters today. Possibly the best known is Stephen Pinker, who wrote a very um, good book, actually, a very readable book um, in 1994, The Language Instinct. Has anyone read The Language Instinct or heard of it? Quite a nice book. And in that book, Stephen Pinker simply says, well, language is biological in the sense that it's, um, it's, it's kind of an instinct in the sense that, that every child, every human child, has got innately um, the capacity to acquire the grammar of a language, and, and the point is that the grammar of a language is an extraordinarily complex structure that even today linguists haven't even fathomed, but a two-year-old, three-year-old child acquires language, masters this, this extraordinary theoretical com complexity as if it kind of knew the basics already, and because in that sense language is biological, it must have evolved, and that's really all Pinker says in that book about how it, he, he simply says, well, it must have evolved, because that's the only known process through which complexity can emerged. But he doesn't come up with a theory. He just says it must have evolved, so it, it did. Meanwhile, Noam Chomsky, who was um, no, uh, Steve Pink, uh, Pinker's uh, teacher, um, argued exactly the opposite. And, and Pinker, I, well, Pinker's got a point, because language must have evolved, and if it evolved, it must have been something to do with Darwinism. But Chomsky's got a very strong point as well, which is that language it's kind of, if you, if, you, if you look at all the different systems of communication there are in the animal world, in the natural world, communication systems of bees and dolphins and elephants and fruit flies and you know, primates, and produce a taxonomy, arrange them in different you know, types, of lang types of communication, the problem is that language is it's just off the scale. It's just right off the chart. There's nothing, anything remotely like language in the animal world. It's not saying that anim animals don't communicate, of course they do. But language has properties which make it so special that it's actually not just a problem for Darwinism, it's a, it's a theoretical problem. It's like Darwinism, it's like lang Darwinism, as we understand it, standard Darwinism, rules out the possibility of a structure like this emerging. No one can work out how, it's even cons how the emergence of language is even consistent um, with Darwinian theory. And so Chomsky uh, concludes, in a way, logically I suppose, that because it's so different, so without any precursor or precedent, we need a different explanation. And uh, his explanation is that um, it suddenly emerged in a, well, one of his versions. He, 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 it emerged very suddenly, instantaneously in fact, and um, his theory, one of the versions of his theory is that um, an, an ape was wandering around um, 
and was hit by a cosmic ray shower. And the cosmic rays caused mutations, as we know, and one mutation in particular hit this, uh, this creature. And it implanted, or installed, is the word Trump used, installed in its, head, in its brain a language organ. Um, and as a result of that, this creature could speak. But as it was the only, only creature around, it had to speak to itself, but that's fine, because language is actually for speaking to yourself, it isn't for communication at all. Um, and so we have this vision of uh, language emerging suddenly as a result of a cosmic ray shower without any precursor. Nothing happened before to build up towards this event. It was just a kind of a bolt from the blue. So we have this kind of seesaw. On the one hand, the, the, the gradualism of Darwinism, and in particular Stephen Pinker, arguing that very gradually over maybe four, five, six million years, possibly because of increased cognitive complexity and intelligence, language gradually evolved, but nobody knows quite how, which kind of sounds reasonable. And then on the other hand, it can't possibly have evolved. It's far too different, far too unprecedented, <coughs> biologically anomalous, and, and must have kind of appeared from nowhere. Um, why is it such a difficult issue? Why is the problem so difficult? So what you've got here are these, this sheet of paper with what I call the seven paradoxes of language evolution. Um, and the first is that what's called the continuity paradox. <coughs> and that is, the continuity paradox, is that Darwinism is descent with modification. And that means that you have to have something to modify in order to get to the adaptation you're talking about. So, for example, um, how did legs evolve? Well, the argument is that some kind of maybe stubby fins in some fish that was you know, living in shallow water. When the fish got stranded in dry land, those fins over time became more stubby, and you've got the legs, but the starting point was fins. Same with any other adaptation. You have to have something to modify for descent with modification to work. And the problem is you don't seem to have anything to start with. And I'm going to take a bit of a risk and um, kind of explain what I mean by doing my own version, not particularly good version, of a chimpanzee pan hoot, <laughs> which I learned from Andrew Fowler, who spent many years living with chimpanzees. And you mustn't get worried. I'm all right. Um, I'll come back to Earth and it'll be OK. People always get a bit concerned for me when I try to do this. Um, but it's, the idea is to show you why you wouldn't really start there if you wanted to develop grammar. Okay? So it's something like this is and you can see it's quite costly, it's difficult, it's emotional, it, it does think I just that, that even just doing that sort of does something to me. I don't you know it's not it's nothing like nothing whatever like saying something in a, using, a, using grammar, using a sentence. So it's just not where you would start if you wanted to move on towards a language and evolution. Terms. So that's the, that's the continuity paradox. Language is so different from primate vocal communication that it, it's just impossible to see how one could lead, lead to the other. So we have this discontinuity. Um, if we accept Chomsky, and a lot of people do, and I do up to a point, that language is an instinct, <coughs> it gets even more difficult. Now, I totally accept that language is an instinct, as in the sense I mentioned earlier. Anyone who's had kids two, three, four years old, you just know you don't have to teach a, a child grammar. If it says, I love you, but it says it in some un ungrammatical sentence or something, whatever it is, you know, you don't, you don't hit it, you don't punish it. It'll find out, it'll, it'll be probably the, the rules it's using will be more regular than they should be. Um, but it somehow, it is true, as Chomsky says, that the child seems to know in advance, it seems to be innately equipped with some knowledge of what a human language might be in terms of the basics. It seems to have the basics already, uh, and, it, and it needs to be in an environment where people are talking, of course, to trigger that it's French rather than English or Swahili or whatever. But there's a rather important sense. Um, children, but not chimpanzees, have got a language instinct, because it is true, as, as I'm sure most of you know, that you can, you can bring up a chimpanzee in your own family. Sue Savage Rumbo, of course, famously did that. Roger Foots, many others have done this. 
<coughs> and although they're completely unable to use their voice, almost completely, they really can't use their tongue, their, their soft palate, the lips, and the way uh, people do, you can, they can use their hands. And something ra something vaguely resembling American Sign Language, it isn't American Sign Language, but it kind of is, although maybe some way towards American Sign Language, they can cope with. And it is quite impressive. I mean, it is, it is actually pretty impressive that um, Kanzi, for example, a bonobo, um, you, you can say to Kanzi, open the fridge, um, top drawer, top shelf, get the orange juice, take the oranges out, put the orange juice on the hat, and then you said no, put the hat on the orange juice. It understands all that, and, it, and, they can, and the chimpanzees can even, they can up to a point sign back. Mostly they're interested in, in getting things. So I think the longest sentence ever um, uttered by a chimpanzee was, um, Give me, give me orange, 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 give me juice, orange, orange, give me, give me, give me, something like, that, something like that. But they do it with signing. And moreover, um, even metaphor, they, they, can, they can not only use metaphor, but actually invent their own metaphors when the chimpanzee or, or bonobo is living in a family. So um, one, of the, one of the examples that Roger Fruit um, gives us is, is the word for um, radish. The, the chimpanzee didn't have a word. But it knew about, it had the word for fruit and had the word for cry, and it decided that a radish is a cry fruit, because it you know, makes it cry, kind of thing. And also other kinds of metaphor, um, when, when, when this particular um, chimp, uh, to, um, uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, when he got cross with, with Roger, he knew the word for shit. <laughs> and he would say, you shit. <laughs> Which, of course, is metaphor when you think about it, because a human being can't just be, can't really be a lump of shit. <laughs> but, yeah, but the so, so these, the, the, so now, okay. So what we've got now is an, the, the fact that humans have a language instinct. Um, chimpanzees seem not to have an instinct. It's true that you can teach them and persuade them and get them to do something, getting maybe a little bit re resembling American Sign Language. But it's odd that an instinct doesn't seem to have precursors among our primate relatives. So if you take sex, that's an instinct. You can easily find sex among non-human primates as other parts of the life on Earth, of course. Um, if you take aggression, plenty of aggression. If you take maternity, there's a maternity and maternal instinct. But the language instinct seems to be, is human. Where did it come from if other animals don't have it? So that, now if you take the strong version, of Chomsky's theory, because I, I don't take this version, but of course Chomsky and his supporters do, this, this language instinct, this, this faculty installed by a random mutation, is like a, a kind of box containing in itself universal grammar, but not only all the, the potential for all the different grammars of all the world's languages, past, present, and possible future, according to Chomsky, this box has already got installed in it, and did have it installed in it when it, the first human um, with acquired language, or was sort of stricken <laughs> with language, inside that black box, according to Chomsky, all the words exist. Not the sounds of the words, but the, but the, the lexical concepts, in other words, the meaning. So, for example, the meaning of I don't know, beer was there, bicycle was there, um, hovercraft was there, <coughs> um, carburetor, he was challenged by this, uh, about this actually, the philosopher Hilary Putnam said, no, surely you can't be saying that in the Stone Age, you know, 100,000 years ago, somewhere in Africa, long before you ever had motor cars, people already had the concept of carburetor in their head. And um, amazingly, um, Chomsky said, uh, yes, they must have done, because you can't, because you can't learn language. It must be, the, the, you know, the, the, the lexicon as well as the, the grammar must be uh, innate. Now, if you take that view, you really, you really have got a problem um, at explaining it. I mean, how on earth did this black box emerge? I mean, the probability of one random mutation producing all the world's grammars and all the world's lexical concepts is far less probable. What's Dawkins, uh, Richard Dawkins had this wonderful idea about a hurricane blowing through a junkyard and by accident, just by random chance, producing a Boeing 707, which actually flies. Um, I mean, th for this to happen, for this language box to emerge, is, is even more improbable than that. In, in that research scenario. So we do have a bit of a problem either way. You, if you take the strong version of Chomsky, it's, it's just, I, I would say, utterly impossible. If you take the more realistic version of Chomsky there, the, the, the more realistic idea of what the language instinct is, it's still a big puzzle that other animals don't seem to have any, any there's, there's no candidate for a precursor of the language instinct among monkeys uh, and apes. 
another paradox. It's the paradox which, which um, undermines the assumption, which is still rather common, that we have labels because we're clever. So this is the cognition communication, cognition versus communication paradox. As I mentioned earlier, Darwin suggested that because he was a clever, we worked out a way of talking to each other, starting with imitating the sounds of birds and cries of animals. But the key thing was that we're clever, and therefore we've got language. That theory doesn't, actually doesn't work, because if you look at if you look at mammals in general during the course of evolution, how they how they evolve, and then if you look in particular at the primate order and, and look at early primates and then you know, more recent ones. You find, I won't draw it really, but um, on the graph, this is um, if ruled by X graph. This is cognition, this is, this is you know, time, and time's moving on, millions of years, millions of years, okay? And then here is complexity. And what happens is that cognition is getting more complex. And that's, that's actually a general rule. It's, it applies to zebras, giraffes, and you know, animals generally. They're, they're over to evolutionary time, they get, they get more clever. Right? Birds. And birds. And birds, yeah. They, they, over time, they get more clever. So this is going up, more and more complexity. And then communication is just stuck there. It's just on a level. There seems to be something holding back complexity of communication. So, for example, chimpanzees don't have vocal communication any more complex than vervet monkeys. Has everyone heard of the vervet monkeys from Ambazeli National Park, Kenya? They've got, they're very famous for having alarm calls, which are differentiated. And when they were first, first this was first found out in the 80s, um, it was said that they, they have kind of got language because the vervets have an alarm call, which means um, leopard. So when, you, when the vervet monkey gives a leopard alarm, Everyone scampers in a way which is appropriate for getting out, getting out, escaping from a leopard. Then you've got another alarm, which means eagle, which means you don't go up in the trees, you come down from the trees. Another one from a snake. And they were initially um, kind of likened to the words of language. Um, that, that is absolutely not true. Um, they're, they're, es they're audible escape responses. They're, they're not in anything, they're not remotely like words, but that's not the point I want to make now. The point I want to make now is that you'll find just as much complexity in vocal communication among monkeys as among the great apes. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of increasing communicative complexity despite the apes getting cleverer and cleverer. So you can't just say we got clever and therefore we had language, it doesn't seem to work that way. Competence performance. That's another rather big paradox. I sort of touched on it a moment ago. Um, that's the fact that um, what linguistic ability chimpanzees have, they don't use. <laughs> There's a conflict between their competence, what they could do, and their performance, what they actually do. So we know what they could do because of it. we've done experiments. We've, we've, we've brought up chimpanzees as if they were family members. So we know they can get the principle of metaphor. They can use limited conventional signs in a you know, you know, pared down version of the American Sign Language. In the wild, they don't. They don't seem to use metaphor at all. There's no, no evidence for a metaphorical system, communication system among wild living chimpanzees, and absolutely no evidence for language at all. And Chomsky makes fun of this. He says these ridiculous evil language people he's talking about, <laughs> he says they say that chimpanzees have got some language ability. He says they've got absolutely zero. He says you know, he's got a kind of Descartes idea that animals are kind of clocks or machines. Um, but anyway, he says they have. They have and what Chomsky says is that anyone who says that a chimpanzee or you know another great ape has got some capacity which it doesn't use is just not thinking straight. He says it just, it's like saying you know fins evolve in a creature that never is, doesn't doesn't swim. How can you have fins and never swim with them? Or wings evolve. In a creature that never flew. It doesn't make any sense. How can you say that elements of language evolve in a creature that in the world doesn't use those, those capacities? It doesn't make any sense. Okay, I don't necessarily agree with Chomsky. I think you can have capacities which you don't use. But you can see there's a, there's a bit of a puzzle. Why and how did the, did the capacity for symbolism evolve in our ape-like ancestors and our primate ancestors if symbolism isn't used by primates in the wild? Why have they got the capacity? Big, big problem. Syntax versus meaning. 
This is to say that you can have, not with, not with um, chimpanzees or great apes, but with other um, creatures, uh, songbirds in particular, but also uh, uh, whales and dolphins and so on, you can have singing. And the songs can be syntactical. Syntactical syntax is about the in, in for linguistics is about the arrangement of words to form sentences, how they're clustered. There's a, a hierarchical structure. And you can get some quite complex syntax in birdsong. Um, but the more syntax there is, the more, if you like, the song that can play around creatively with the ordering of the notes of the song, the less meaning is left in any single note. So the more you play around with the signal, the less it means. Now, the way I would, just to make that idea simple, is just to think of a, think of a songbird, what is it doing? The, the songbird is basically, it's, a, it's always a male, and it's singing, <coughs> the message is basically, I'm the best male, um, it's singing to the females, of course, and it's basically saying, females you know, come, uh, rival males, go away. Um, and the complexity is part of its display of fitness. So it doesn't matter how complex this, the bird's song is, the female is asking a kind of different question. And her question is something like, yeah, but how long can he keep it up for? <laughs> and can he do it on the top of that branch there? Can he do it right at the top of the tree? And can he keep on doing it all day instead of eating worms? So she's interested in... If she's evaluating the signal on a level which is testing the capacity, the fitness of that bird. She's not interested in whether this note's high or this note's low. Uh, I mean, you know, it's nice to have a nice song, but the high note versus the low note doesn't change the meaning one little bit, for, as far as she's concerned. And that's, by the way, that's called phonological syntax. And uh, just to summarise the paradox, it's just like... So what is it she's impressed with, then? A very clever bird that can sing for a very long time, very early in the morning, instead of picking up the worms, and doing it on the top branch of a tree where it's in danger from a hawk. <coughs> And, doesn't, and, 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 and the birds song and complexity and creativity, and they like, they like variety. They, they like variety. That's right. They, they like variety, but they're not. They're not. They're not going to be. There's no. There's no note or difference between notes which will change the whole meaning of the song at all. Which is what well, we, I'll come into that later on. But that, that, that's what uh, that language doesn't. Now the next one is here on this sheet here: modality independence. And this is another very strange thing, um, which is. Okay, um, all animals and humans, of course, as well. We're, we're kind of multimodal. We can use when we when we're communicating, when we're expressing some idea or some emotion or something. We don't just use the voice. We tend to use the voice and the body and the hands. Like I'm you know, waving my hands around, um, and, um, that, and that's called multimodal. So we have multi multimodal communication: just sound, uh, vision, hands, you know, posture, all kinds of things going on, facial expressions on going on as well as the sound. But modality independence is different. With language, spoken language, you can cut out everything except the sound. I mean, we like to gesticulate. It's not good to look at somebody when they're talking because you can, you can, you're getting a lot of help from their body language, their posture, and their, their gesticulations. But even if it's in a dark room and someone's telling a story, the story's there. So even when it's narrowed down to purely sound, everything's there. And now what happens if you can't use that modality? What happens to children that are, that are impaired in terms of voice or hearing? They use their hands. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then everything comes out just in the hands. It's quite amazing. So you can switch between a purely visual and a purely vocal <coughs> system without any loss. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a language instinct, it's a bit of an odd instinct that it can come up this way or out, come up that way. And when you think about it, yeah, that is a bit odd. I mean, you know, what would happen if you don't, it's cruel, you shouldn't do this, but you take a songbird and you put the last tape around its beak. How's its song going to come out through its wings? <laughs> kind of, when you think of it, it doesn't even make sense, because for animal communication, the, the medium kind of is the message in the sense of an intimate connection between the, the message and the modality that's being used. And for humans to have, be able to switch between one modality and another, that's what a modality independence is. And again, it's a, it's a puzzle. It's very hard to think of anything else in the animal world which could switch between modalities. Of course, nowadays we can switch and do all sorts of other modalities with language. You can use the email, 
all kinds of funny things, you know, writing first, then email and so on, so we've got even more modalities these days. But anyway, right, the last one, and this is, in my view, the most important, the costly signal um, paradox. Uh, in, in a way, we've, we've touched on it. When I was saying this, the female blackbird, the female uh, songbird species, when she hears beautiful, complex singing by the, the male, by the, by the singer, her interest in it is, yes, but how long can you keep it up for? And how much can you keep varying? <laughs> so that the quantity of variation, the amount of energy put into the song, the risk taken by the singer in terms of being high up a branch, the, you know, the, the fitness to be able to carry on singing with all that energy without eating any worms. Can you see what the female's doing? She's, even, if, even if a note is cheap, and a note, one note is cheap, it doesn't cost any more for the songbird to produce a high note than a low note. But she doesn't care about that. The, the way she's evaluating the signal is on a costly signaling scale. She's interested in testing the fitness of the singer. And, what, and that can't be faked. There's a, there's a causal connection between the signal um, and the body of the signaler. So if you just think in terms of, and this is kind of classic Saussurean theory, Ferdinand Saussure, de Saussure, but course in general linguistics in the 1912, kind of a standard work in structuralism, I won't go into all that detail, but he simply said, look, you've got a thing called a signifier, that's a physical thing, and then you've got the signified, what it means in terms of a concept, uh, and there's a distance between the signified and the signifier. But in animal communication, it's not. The signifier and the signifier are, are this close. Um, it's a bit like when, in, with, with us humans, you know, we're, we're, Somebody crying, somebody getting red in the face with fury, somebody getting aroused in some way, somebody obviously shivering with fear, somebody shitting themselves in terror. Somehow, can you see what's happening? The, the, the message is, is causally linked to the body sending out that message. There's no, there's no gap. Um, and what happens is that animals, even when they could uh, do something different and produce cheap signals like we do, because words are cheap, they could produce very cheap signals. What happens is that nobody cares about those? In the animal world, there's not sufficient trust to be able to rely on a signal which isn't tied to the body, and in that sense, costly, demanding actual material investment in the signal. Um, now, all I'm saying is that that is just a, a universal law. Animal signaling is costly. It doesn't have to be very costly, but it's always a huge well, always a major component of the signal is the cost of it. So rather, to put it a different way, a major, a major component of the investment in the signal is put there to, to convince listeners that it's not a fake, that it's reliable. And a much less amount of effort is put into differentiating this signal from some contrasting different signal. So costly signaling is just the it's, it's, it's like it's a Darwinian theory. Darwinian theory applied to signal evolution, it, 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 we call it costly signaling theory, or the handicap principle. It's a wonderful book um, by uh, Emerson and Avishak Sahavi, published um, in 1997, which convinced, I think, most, most certainly most biologists that that's how signals um, evolve. And that's a problem, because, of course, words are cheap. Very cheap. It, it, they cost, it costs nothing to remove voicing from a consonant like P, um, or sorry, you've got a consonant like B, uh, Bill, take the voicing off the first consonant and it says Pill, you know, so, and, and so, so, I mean, in, in human language, there's, there's no difference in cost between, I don't know, we will, um, we will meet you tomorrow, we will eat you tomorrow, I mean, the second one is you need to run, the first one is okay, it didn't cost me anything to switch between them, but it's a massive difference, life and death difference in meaning. And that's, it, it's impossible to explain how that, how, how that could have emerged, because it, it defies Darwinian logic. So, those are the um, paradoxes. Right. How do we solve the problem? Um, I'm a Marxist, and I came out of this having read Engels. Um, the part played by Labour in the transition from ape to man. And uh, it's great, and the theory is that man is the toolmaker. And once you've got tools, you're going to get cooperation, and as well as cooperation, you're going to get some means of communication which helps coordinate the cooperation. So out of labour, cooperative labour, comes language, 
and Engels put it very well when he said that the man in the making, our ancestors in the process of becoming human, arrive at the stage, of, as he put it, when humans discovered that they had something to say to each other. So the argument is there that if, you've got, if you're not needed to cooperate with everybody else, you've got nothing to say to people, really. You can just get on with things yourself. <coughs> you only need language when you've got something to say to other people, and that only happens when we depend on each other as a result of cooperative um, labor, which is a good theory, and it's the theory which I still support. And as it so happens, it's a theory very powerfully backed by Michael Tomasello and his colleagues who until recently were um, at the, at the um, Institute of Evolutionary um, Anthropology and Psychology at Leipzig. So it's a good theory, but it's kind of, it needs some extra bits. And Karl Marx actually added one of the crucial extra bits, because when Karl Marx was talking about labor, he, he drew a, con a very sharp contrast between two types of architect. Um, so he wrote about the architect and the bee, the human architect and the bee, and he said, yes, all right, the bee does all sorts of complicated things with its hives and everything else, but does it imagine the future hive in its brain and then work to collaborate with others to make that dream a reality? Only the human architect does that. Now, I'm not, you know, there's so many things you can say about the difference between humans and animals, so that's kind of, I don't, that's not really the road I want to go down, but just to say that in addition to labor, we need to think about that aspect, the dream, the plan, the mind, the future, having a, having a plan and then working together to implement that plan. And just by the way, really crucially, labor isn't labor if it's just tool use. And, and, the, and it's true that Engels was saying that tool use needs to be cooperative, but for language to work, we need to have sufficient cooperation to enable cheap signals, which deeply suppose quite strange levels of trust we need that cooperation to, to embrace an entire community. It's not just enough for individuals to cooperate temporarily with each other. There has to be a cooperative, overarching framework. Um, one of the points, by the way, that Michael Tomasello um, makes. So, um, just in a nutshell, to say to, to three words can sum up what I think are key to the solution, although words themselves are never a solution, but they can just focus our minds in a useful direction. Dreams, play, uh, and trust, um, and of course they're kind of connected. When we play, when we engage in pretend play at any rate, where it's like in the way we're, in, we're entering a kind of dream world, the world of let's pretend, and the world of let's pretend depends on quite a lot of trust, and I'll come back to that um, afterwards. But let's just go through. Um, these paradoxes again. I'm going to quickly run through the paradoxes, just saying, let's look at those paradoxes again, thinking in terms of trust and what bearing that has on these problems. So could it be that the reason for the continuity paradox, the fact that we can't find a precursor for vocal language among the primates, has something to do with the question of trust? That big uh, that, you know, pantheon I was giving you, you can't mistake the meaning of it and it's evidently a costly signal, and it doesn't presuppose any trust. So you can certainly say that animal signals, they, they, they create the conditions for relying on them. It's like once, once an animal's producing a costly signal, it's kind of generating trust in that signal. So on the spot, like on the fly, you're producing confidence that the signal is for real. Um, so could it, and, and you can imagine some social change happening quite rapidly, not in an instant, like Chomsky says, but having quite rapid, some cultural or social thing happening quite rapidly to produce sufficient trust for that leap, if you like, to be made between costly signals and cheap signals, or between animal communication and, and language. I mean, that's not an explanation, that's just a you know, looking at that continuity paradox from a, a, a social perspective, and a, because clearly trust is a social thing, isn't it? You trust or don't trust other people, and if you don't trust them, uh, you, you, you're not going to be listening to their words, really. Language isn't going to work in a, in a general atmosphere of mistrust. Um, perhaps the black box we can sort of come back to. But, um, but uh, as I say, there's, there's this version of toxic theory which I think is just completely crazy. That I do, this box has got all these words sort of locked in there, and, and, you know, and they've been there since we became human. But the idea of 
The idea of, a, of an instinct, let's look at it again. My own view is that there is a language instinct, and it does have a precursor, and it's play. Uh, animals play. And so I, I'm, 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 I'm play is getting towards, getting in a direction of symbolism. I'll come back to that in a moment, because it, that, that's a, otherwise we're going to take the whole evening going into exactly what types of play there are and so on. Cognition versus communication. I was showing you that, that imaginary graph of uh, cognitive complexity increasing, but the complexity of communications remaining kind of stuck. Now, that is worth looking at in terms of trust. Especially when we look at non-human primates. The, the word used to describe non-human primates, that's monkey and ape intelligence, is Machiavellian. They have Machiavellian intelligence. So monkeys and apes, they're not communists, they're not egalitarians. They live in what we would regard as pretty despotic social hierarchies, often with a dominant male, a bunch of males, very rarely a bunch of dominant females, as with Bonobo, but there's always this dominant hierarchy. Um, and the animals, um, to say they're Machiavellian, is not to say anything nasty about them, it's just to say, you do what you can get away with doing. You don't have any kind of moral principles. Um, so that's, that, that's Machiavelli's, you know, and the prince, you know, the back of the, the book. Um, advice to a prince, just, you know, make promises, break them as soon as you can, if you can get away with it. Don't worry about all that stuff. And um, primates are kind of, kind of like that. And they're especially on the lookout for being tricked. And they're especially on the lookout to, do, for, to being tricked when it's a species that's clever enough to perform lots of deceptive tricks. So the book, the first volume of the book, Machiavellian Intelligence, um, produced uh, Kevin over here, uh, has been for the last year, um, uh, Andrew Whiten and Dick Byrne, was giving examples of animal deception and lots of, lots of cases of monkeys and apes using deception as a, as a strategy to gain an advantage. So the, the, one, I mean, the one I remember most is um, the Amazelli National Park, and um, um, these um, monkeys, actually no, these were baboons, sorry, the baboon, sorry, the baboon, the, what? Sorry? Which are monkeys, sorry? They are the baboons, quite right, well, the baboons are monkeys, and these monkeys <laughs> are called baboons. <laughs> um, what, what happened, is just one little example, um, if I can remember it right, um, uh, an adolescent male had been really winding up the infants, you know, teasing them, being frightening them, scaring them, and, the, and their infants' mother and aunts were getting more and more fed up with all this. So they decided to um, um, launch a punishment party against this adolescent. So they started chasing him, and he scampered off. He was scampering off, and suddenly did something really odd. He looked at the horizon as if he'd seen a leopard. And the, the punishment party all looked the same way to see where this leopard. And by the time they realised it was an imaginary leopard, <laughs> the culprit had vanished. And, and, then, and then, of course, the punishment party forgot what the argument was about, and he managed to use that deception um, to escape. Notice that it wasn't vocal deception. It was this whole body was doing the deception. <coughs> and one of the points, really, which Harvey makes very powerfully, is that um, monkeys and apes, they find it very difficult to use their vocal signals deceptively. Um, and there's a, a reason for that. What, what, why would it be not a good idea to be picked out by all your mates as a constant liar with your voice? You wouldn't last. You wouldn't last. Well, I mean, you wouldn't last, but I mean, is anyone going to believe you? I mean, there's a little story about that, isn't there? The boy who cried wolf. So, and sound is really important. You, you, the animals need the sound modality because sound is great for communication. It goes around corners, you can use it in the dark. Other people's ears don't have to be pointing away like you do with sight. So there are all kinds of advantages of sound, and if you screw up that modality by being known to be constantly lying, you then can't, you know, you can make as much noise as you like, and no one will take a bit of notice. And that kind of pressure just forced the primates to constantly fall back on those aspects of the body, yeah, those aspects of signaling through the body, which can least be faked. Can you see what's happening? I mean, does anyone kind of understand that? What would happen in our society if we'd never trusted at each other at all, I and mean, we were all involved in all kinds of activities, bank robbery and all kinds of stuff from each other's houses and everything else, and you see somebody and you, you know, maybe you've robbed a bank together, I don't know, and your mate sort of says, by the way, you want to know where the loot is? And he sort of says, 
you know, 49, 43, whatever street, you know, the Agniatic or something. I mean, are you, you going to believe him? And if you don't believe him, what are you going to do? How, what signals that he's passing out are you going to be interested in? And it's, it's just, it's as old as the hills, isn't it? You, you're looking for the hard to fake signals. Mm -hmm. Eyes, are they a bit shifty? Beads of sweat, colour of the face. You're, you're interested in the part of the body which can't lie to know that it's true. Okay? Non-human primates are like that. They, w they won't believe anything which might be a lie mm -hmm. because they're so clever at lying. See? So the more clever you are at lying, the less lying there is because everyone's wise to it. And that dynamic is producing what this, you know, this thing I said about, you've got the cognition going up, it's Machiavellian. Communication stays simple, because if you're going to keep using hard to fake body language, that is simple. Very simple. You're just, you're just signaling with your body, with your, with, and with the parts of the body that you can't even control. So, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit now. In this volume, The Social Origins of Language, Jerome Lewis, of course, been giving talks here, and I'm going to come back to it in a moment. And I, we, we were thinking about the tongue. The tongue is the major articulator. So we, in, when we're talking, we use the lips, the tongue, the soft palate, the jaw, the teeth, and so on. Tip of the tongue, body of the tongue, all this thing. They're called articulators because they, you know, they articulate. They, they switch voicing off and on, palatization off and on. You can open and close the lips and all those things. And of course, the tongue is doing a huge amount of complex work. Why is it that when a chimpanzee gives a pan to I wasn't using my tongue at all. And this is a point again from St. Hadris, um, Tazubaguga makes. He says the tongue is set aside in primate communication. They don't use the tongue. They use parts of the vocal apparatus which are bodily, um, which reflect emotion and stuff. And it's not that they can't use the tongue, they probably could do, but they, they, they don't. And there are all kinds of exceptions so some of the stuff I'm going to say in a minute, which Kevin will, I'm sure we'll come up with. But we, we just said, right, and maybe I can just ask you to just tell me, why don't non-human primates use the tongue when they're communicating? Is it, I mean, one theory, and, that, and this is where I disagree with, with Klaus. Klaus says it's a strange defect, peculiarly inflexible tongue. Um, so these animals have sort of evolved with a defective tongues, if you like. I don't believe that. It's completely silly. You can't imagine an animal with an inflexible tongue. What would an animal with an inflexible tongue look like? How would it, where would it be? What would it be doing? It's got an inflexible tongue. What do you do with your tongue? Watch it eating. You have to watch it eating. You have to watch it eating, but then what would happen? The tongue's inflexible. You wouldn't need it, would you? Can't you, need to, you need to swallow stuff. Yeah. The tongue is the, almost the most flexible, sensitive, full of nerves organ we've got apart from the hands. We've got hands, we've got tongue. Because the tongue is hugely flexible and manipulable, you can consciously manipulate your tongue. Can you see? Therefore, it won't be used in signaling. Because the tongue can lie. Yeah? That, that seems to me the obvious answer. So if the tongue, in the course of human evolution, was switched over from being excluded from communication to suddenly becoming, you know, rapidly becoming, the central, the most important articulator, the, you know, the core of spoken language, it was so that we could lie. Sorry? I said it was so that we could lie. Yeah, but we, that's true. That's, that's kind of true. But can you see as well that if we were just lying, we, nobody would listen to that stuff and we'd be listening to other stuff that wasn't a lie. But I, don't want to be, I don't want to be lied to. No one needs to be lied to. But you, there's another, there is a sense in which that's right. I will come on to that. There's a, there's a really important sense in which everything is a lie. All of religion is a lie. All of symbolic culture is a lie. We inhabit a world of hallucinations, and that's why it works. I mean, that's, you, you made me jump to that. Well, you <laughs> the, just the said it yourself. Well, you said right. in animals it, the, the tongue is only used for eating because yeah, it's right. so flexible, it's okay. designed for lying. Okay. Okay. You said fine. that. That's fine. Great. Okay. So, and then now, again, syntax versus meaning. Can you see that uh, this is the problem with this paradox. We've got, we've got, what happens with animals is if the syntax is high, that means if the animal is capable of playing around with the signal in a very creative way, the meaning of the signal crashes to a really minimal meaning, like, like look, at, look what I can do, uh, more than they can do. Um, and if you do the opposite, if you want the meaning to be high, lots and lots of meaning, you have to have the syntax reduced to a minimum. 
I won't go into all this, but one of our contributors, um, Kazuo Okinawa, a Japanese um, uh, zoologist working with uh, Bengalese finches, he, he managed to show how if you take from a how does it go? If you take from a if you take he breeds these finches and kind of get trained and learn from each other over, over many generations. If you take a meaningful part of a zebra finch's song, or just a, maybe a meaningful chirp it makes as a, as a result of maybe it's a predator alarm or something, and you insert it into the song and the animal starts to play around with it, which you can do, which it will start to do when they're domesticated. The more this, the more that signal, the meaningful signal is played around with and inserted into the syntactic complexity, the less it means. So if you're playing around with stuff, it doesn't mean any meaning. If you wanted to mean something, don't play around with it. That's is the story of the development of the Bengalese finch from the the wild bird, yeah? Don't explain it. Oh, well, oh, come on. The, in the last two, three hundred years, they, they bred from this very drab little bird called the Munia, a wild bird in Southeast Asia. So in Bengal and, and neighboring areas, they bred this very pretty colored finches. They were breeding them for their color and prettiness, but it so turned out that they started, instead of having the very simple song of the Munia, yeah. they started to develop this extraordinary song complexity, probably um, selected by females who wanted to have these complex songs. And yeah. yeah. um, so you take the bird from a wild, wild circumstance, where its signaling is very constrained, you put it in a domesticated situation, and then it's in a situation where it's unconstrained and it can play and develop that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it's just the, yeah. Yeah. The, the meaning, there's not, the, it grows in complexity of syntax, but it doesn't grow in complexity of meaning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, was, I, I, was, I was very pleased because Kazu himself, who does all, these, all this work, he, um, in one of his articles, he called this Knight's Seesaw. <laughs> Got my name on the back. <laughs> Night seesaw is this alternation. If, if you if you increase the complexity, the syntactic complexity, you reduce the meaning. If you increase the meaning, you reduce the complexity, and then you have this huge paradox: language. This is if you've taken both ends of that seesaw and you've lifted them both up, wrenched the axle, you know, off the joint. You, you, you push syntax high, hugely high, massive syntactic complexity, and massively complex meaning at the same time. Again, defying all the laws of signal evolution in the animal world. But we're now, doing, we're now looking at all that in the light of this idea of play. But clearly, if everything's playful, if everything's kind of version of let's pretend, if we're involved, if we're, if we're inhabiting a virtual world, you can see how those dynamics will be changed. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't have high meaning and high complexity if the meaning doesn't mean anything, or rather if the meaning only, if you're if in, Signaling meanings, you're navigating a virtual world, and it hasn't got any immediate and physical, um, you know, life and death consequences. Language, just to you know, make a point, when we're talking to each other, we're inhabiting virtual reality. I mean, everything I'm talking about is not in this room. I haven't once mentioned any of your shoes or the wall. We're talking about stuff which isn't here. As anyone speaking, we're moving around in virtual reality. That's the difference. That's the difference. It's, it, it, what June was just saying, it's not all a lie. Maybe what I'm saying isn't a lie, but it's certainly not in this room. It certainly can't touch it, weigh it, feel it, smell it. It's, it's a lie in the sense it's a shared you know, imagining that we're doing in language, which is really so utterly different from what animals are doing. As to, as to, as to Trotsky was different with everything on the screen. So is it as though syntax has actually become the meaning itself? Well, I wouldn't quite want to say that. Syntax definitely hugely governs changes in meaning. If you alter the syntax, that, that's, that, that, there's a kind of, kind of engine which generates different meanings. Um, but I wouldn't say this. I would, there has to be a distinction between the formal structure and then, on the other hand, what it means. But there's, a, there's certainly a big distance between the signifier and the signified, between the sounds and what they mean. There's a huge difference which I'm going to come back to. How much time have I got? Okay, so I've got 10, 15 minutes. Right, so, okay, um, the crucial um, parameters are, are trust versus mistrust. I think we've, uh, that, that's the point I'm making. And to make that point more clear, that I hope some of you will remember when Jerome 
Lewis was talking here about the Mengeli. Does everyone remember his, his concept of Masana? He was talking about Masana among these pygmy forest people. Does anyone remember at all what the word Masana no. might mean? Thank you, Annie. And what's the significance of the word play for the Masana? Why is it so interesting that they have this word Masana? Does it just mean play? It's sort of important as well. Yes. Or it's not insignificant. When you say play, what kind of play? Who's playing? <coughs> oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's got a religious significance as well, hasn't it? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gregory. Good. The, the word masana, it means when children are just playing their games, their games of let's pretend, being monsters and whatever, do they're having great fun, they have a boys, girl, boys group over here, girls group over there, usually, and they're playing with all kinds of, you know, pretending to be gorillas or, you know, whatever. That's called masana. When adults perform religious rituals, that's called masana. So the Benjeli know, and the children also perform their own versions, mm -hmm. playful versions of their adult, their parents and the adults' rituals. Can you see why, why that's important? It's because, unlike us, <laughs> they kind of know that when they're doing their religion, it's all a okay. game. They kind of know that it's playful. They know that they're kind of producing the spirits, that the spirits wouldn't be there if they weren't playing the game. Whereas we tend to imagine that God's there anyway, and then we need, because God's there, we need to you know, you know, do what he says and you know, go to church and all that stuff. But God's there kind of anyway, independently of us. That's a different conception of religion. So the Masana idea means everything's play, but it's not any old play, it's pretend play. And in pretend play, you construct a world. And actually, it plays quite um, serious stuff for children, as well as it is for adults. I'm going to come back to that kind of quote a little bit from uh, the passage by the Johan Vizink in a moment. Um, but um, the we one of the reasons why I think that's so important that, that Jerome coming in to this debate and uh, giving us this concept from the, the Benjeli uh, Masana, it, what I think is that it could well be that the reason why, or a big part of the reason why we haven't sorted out the problem of the origin of language is because of our own dichotomies, our own categories, which just mess us up completely. So Westerners, you know, academics, perhaps especially, specialists in religion, maybe anthropologists, we have religion over there, ritual over there, and play over there. And it could be the Medjelia right, that what you have is play, and you can do different things with play, and if you make it more serious and adult, it becomes what we call religion. If, it, if, it's, if it's kids doing it, and it's much more spontaneous and less, if you like, regularised, it's then play. But really it's the same thing. Um, as an, as a, another, this, that idea that we need to get rid of those dichotomies uh, has also emerged quite recently in the, in the study of um, <coughs> spoken language in connection with gesture. So... Right. Um, when we talk, we gesticulate. And we all know that, don't we? I mean, we don't need to be signing with our hands when we're on the mobile phone to each other, but everywhere you go in the street, you just speak together. Yeah. Gesticulating all over the place. No one can see it. And it doesn't get down the phone line or to the airwaves up to the moon and back, but it, we do it. Showing, really, that when we gesticulate, we are doing it for ourselves, basically. I mean, it does help people to be able to see some things. I mean, if we say, I mean, for example, the one of these classic examples from uh, one of the studies um, with Neil, yeah, he says, uh, it's like, uh, one of his, um, he was, a woman was just saying, um, and I ran all the way up the stairs. And, you know, she wasn't even aware she was doing this. But it adds a huge amount of information. It was a spiral stairs. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it ran all the way up the stairs, it's boring. But ran all the way up the stairs, it just gives you the vital information. Um, another example, um, well, I mean, I won't give you any more examples. So anyway, Adam Kendon, who's one of our friends and colleagues who's written in this book, he originally came out with a, with a kind of taxonomy of gestures. So you have like beats, just to keep time with. You have, you have iconics, they're gestures which look like what you're saying, like this one is an iconic gesture. Um, you then have metaphorics. Metaphorics are th what I do all the time, you know, people do all the time. You're, you're using spatial uh, shapes with your hands to convey abstract concepts. 
you know, abstract concepts here in my hands. I just noticed my hands coming like that. You know, I don't know why abstract concepts have like that. That's the big boob <laughs> symbol, that is. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big boob symbol. <laughs> me. That's an interesting point. One of, the point. one of the points about these gestures is that they, they can be anything depending on the, 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 the verbal part of the spoken language. You know, so this could be a corkscrew. It doesn't have to be style circuits, but in the context you work it out, it must be a style circuit. Okay, anyway, and then he had, so he had, yeah, um, as I say, beats, um, iconics, metaphorics, uh, and then he has another category called um, emblems. Emblems are like this, or that, or this, or, or that. Yeah, I don't know, all these funny things, or in, in, in Italian, of course, they've got a huge number of them. So, so, um, so uh, emblems are standardised um, gestures which have a conventional meaning. So when I go like that, it means no. But in quite a lot of Europe, um, it means yes, of course. Um, in Slovakia and other parts of Europe, you have to say that to mean no, um, and this to mean yes, which I find really difficult. Uh, <laughs> there are historical explanations for why that, why that all happened. But anyway, those are emblems. And then he has, and then he has further, he has pantomime. And then McNeil, who is a student of Kendra's work and done all the most fantastic work on gesture, he said, yeah, all right, we've got this, we've chopped up the continuum to these iconics and metaphorics and emblems and pantomimes and all that stuff. He said, why not not do that? Why not just see a continuum and just have parameters, more or less of this or that, more or less iconicity, more or less imaginary, more or less loud, more or less conscious. And then we, and if we just get rid of the categories, we can see what, what's going underneath. We can see what's producing, the dynamics that are producing these differences, which we then, maybe wrongly, decide to, to, to treat as totally different um, you know, entities, if you like. So that then got called Kendon's Continuum. So we now, we now tend to think of not chopping things up, but just tend to think of gestures which are more or less conventionalized, more or less iconic. Iconic means, of course, forming a picture, more or less metaphoric more as pantomime. Pantomime means you know, you're actually using a whole body and doing a, 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 producing a narrative with voice and you know, sound as well as, as gestures. So I think that's a very good idea, because it seems to me that very often the categories just get in the way. So that's just, I said all that, partly just to um, validate Jerome Lewis's idea that Masana is a very good idea, because by getting rid of all the different categories religion, ritual, play, and all that. It actually sees us really what's happening. And so, my view is that you start with play, um, and it can go in different directions. Now, okay, maybe I need to say a bit more about play. Um, why I start with play? Right, we're looking for a precursor in the animal world, or some glimpse in the animal world, animal world of symbolic communication. And the anthropologist Gregory Bateson, who was at one time the husband of Margaret Mead, did some wonderful work. He went to um, the zoo in, I think it was in San Francisco, and he watched some monkeys um, play fighting. Um, obviously, people had seen monkeys play fighting lots of times, but it took somebody like Gregory Bateson, Bateson uh, wrapped up in his own head to think, like maybe Newton did when this mythical apple fell on his head. I mean, so he suddenly thought, right, what is happening? One monkey is biting another, but not really. It's not a bite. It's a nip. So think about it. When monkeys play, go to any park, see the dogs playing, you've got an aggressive action, biting, chasing, you know, all that. But the, the, the victim of that aggressive action, the biting or the chasing, knows somehow that it's not intended violently, not intended. So you have something which is negative in form, but the intention is exactly the reverse. To be involved in a, in a rough and tumble game, there's more trust and more friendship in a rough and tumble fight than there is in saying how do you do and shaking hands and stuff. Because you're you're putting a, a when, just think of a dog when it's playing. You, you, have you, have you, I mean, you see this all the time, don't you? I, I love going to hilly fields where I live and watching the dogs play. It's fantastic, especially now in the evening when they've got these little lights on their collars. <laughs> <laughs> But, what, but a big dog playing with a small dog. The big dog's got a... There won't be a game if the big dog keeps winning. The big dog's got a large back and the little dog bite his neck. Okay? It's got to be reverse dominance to get the play working. And can you see what's happening? 
the nips, the, the aggressive actions are, they're not, to call them symbols would probably be a bit of a stretch, but can you see what's happening? There's now a distance, that's what we need. There's going to be a distance between the form of the signal and this meaning. And the, and the relationship between the form of the signal, the bite, say, and the meaning, which is affection, it's, it's a reversal. The, the, the intended meaning is not just different from the apparent meaning, it's actually the opposite of the apparent meaning. A nip is the reverse of a bite because the intention is the opposite. So chimps do use metaphors. They can use metaphors. <laughs> and, and I, no, but you see, no, 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 this is really, thank you, I'm really saying this. I'm saying watch some chimpanzee infants or juveniles play. No one, uh, it's not true to say that people don't study play. I mean, that is mean, shameful. Ethologists <laughs> have studied play wonderfully. There's a wonderful lot of work on, done on play. The problem is that this crowd, my crowd, the evil old people, the people who are, I'm afraid, rather too much influenced by Noam Chomsky, the last place they would look for in, t in search of a language instinct would be play. And yet it seems to me quite clear that play has all the characteristics we need, all the trust, all the imagination, all the creativity, which is key to language, and this whole point about, you know, about reversing meanings because intentions are reversed. So that, and, in, and of course in play, well, dogs don't do, pretend, don't do pretend play, and neither do monkeys, I don't think. But chimpanzees, they certainly can do pretend play. I'm not sure how much pretend play happens in the wild, but there is that lovely story from Franz de Waal. I can't remember which of his volumes, but he was describing something at the um, Arnhem Zoo, and uh, there was an old male who had a limp, dominant male, had been a dominant male with a limp, and behind them was a trail of juveniles all going limp like that, <laughs> <laughs> mimicking him. So, I mean, that is lovely. That's, and that's, and there's some bonobo blind man's butt. Yeah, so, so, so what I'm saying is when you, when you see that the, the only possible precursor for the symbolic characteristics of language and the creativity and the associated trust, when you see that the only possible source of all this is play, what it does is great because it makes you think, right, what had to happen to play in order to get to where we, are, we humans are? What had to happen? I'm going to talk about this a bit more next week and a bit more the week after. With next week we're then going to do the, I'm going to have some nice slides of cosmetics and stuff. I mean, in an absolute nutshell, what had to happen is to something had to enable play to survive development and not collapse. What I mean by that is with chimpanzees, they play fight until sex comes along. And why is it that when male chimpanzees or gorillas or others are just getting interested in sex, their hormones are beginning to rage, why is it that at that point they don't want to lose the game anymore? <laughs> it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Once you've lost, it sets a precedent, you're a loser, you don't get the females, whatever it was in your genes that made you do that, they're not going to get transmitted to your offspring because you won't be having any offspring. You can immediately see why, when a sex comes along, you know, the trust disappears, and even two brothers who've been played beautifully together will start fighting over the females. So that's exactly what happens. With humans, somehow, play, the playfulness of childhood, this is what Masana means, the playfulness of childhood must have somehow survived into adulthood and survived that storm of sex. Somehow sex, was normally would disrupt play and you ended up in violence, somehow sex didn't do that. And we kind of know why from Jerome's work, as well as the theory that Camilla's got and we've been working with. The point was that somehow, it, it, it was something with female strategies, clearly, we, we're sure of that, somehow play itself, sorry, sex itself became, in, became embraced by play. The rules of play, the rules of fairness, the <coughs> rules of, you know, all the kind of morality of, of a let's pretend game somehow managed to incorporate sex into itself. And when we say, when we see, okay, how is it, what do we mean when we say that in hunter-gatherer cultures, sex is subordinated to the rules of play? I don't know what we're talking about. We're talking about something called kinship. The rules of kinship. You know, don't have sex with your mother-in-law. Don't have sex with your sister. This person you can have sex with. This person you can't. The rules of the game incorporate sex actually crucially. In fact, if, if sex wasn't part of the play, part of the game, it's you know, almost like a chess game, isn't it, when you think of the kinship system. Knights, pawns, bishops, all they like to do different things, mother-in-law, daughter, so, you know. If, 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 if sex wasn't subjected to the rules of play, 
the rules of kind of let's pretend, um, then what would happen would be the opposite. <laughs> Sex would, just, would explode and destroy play. And what happened with non-human primates is that, and maybe I should explain this as well, everything which is most reminiscent of language among, say, chimpanzees, seems to happen in a play context. So let me just give you some examples. These are from Thomas Sello, but other whole lot of authors. I'm sure Kevin at St. Andrews has studied this more, maybe more than I have. Um, but um, if it's supposing a, a young chimp wants an older chimp to play a certain game. Now, this the particular game I'm thinking of is when the older chimp um, lets you, the younger chimp, leap over him with one hand on his shoulder. And you know, you know that this is okay, you've done it before. And you, the young chimp, you, you start doing this, you do the beginnings of the play action, and you keep on pestering with it, come down this, and, this, and eventually he gets it, it's all right then, you know, and you do that. So what happens is the, the, the young chimp has worked out for itself a little conventional symbol, which means let's play this game. And I will, I will just say there's a list of those, by far the biggest number of word-like or almost sentence-like gestures that chimps use are used in the context of play. And that's not an accident. That's because you wouldn't even be playing if there wasn't a huge amount of trust. So, and it's the trust which allows these suggestively linguistic, almost, almost like sign language, glimpses of language um, begin to develop. And what we're saying is that the, the human revolution, we think it was led by women for various reasons, led by the female sex, who were at least, you know, least able to afford the cost of male violence and intimidation and abuse and harassment and all that kind of crap. Um, females actually enabled through certain kinds of rituals, certain kinds of dancing, um, play to continue and actually embrace the whole of adult life. And when it does embrace the whole of life, adult life we call it, whatever we call it, we call it maybe religion, although religion is not a very good word. We can describe it hunter-gatherer cosmologists when they don't have an all-powerful God or God who wants to stay out there and keep us down here. Maybe their, their, their spirit beings tend to be more humorous. Tricksters, for example, um, woman's biggest husband is the moon, and the way the moon's come down from the sky is linking up with women and giving her access to special information, privileged information about blood of women and childbirth, as well as animals. So somehow everything, once, once the world is embraced by the principles of play, you can now use signals which are cheap and, and navigate that play domain. In a, in a completely new way. It's like, it's like we humans are inhabiting a, a let's pretend world, which means that communication is just radically different from what other animals do, because other animals aren't living in let's pretend. Other animals are living in all too real um, uh, reality. Maybe I'll just um, read this lovely passage from um, the Dutch historian and philosopher. Does anyone speak Dutch? Probably pronounce this wrong. Johan Huizinga. Huizinga. Utsinger. Utsinger. Thank you, Robin. Utsinger. Thank you. Okay. Um, he wrote this fantastic book just after the war, Homo Ludens, a study of the play element in culture. Uh, he introduced the concept of the magic circle. All play moves and has its being within a playground. Just as there is no formal difference between play and ritual, okay, on. so the consecrated spot cannot be formally distinguished from the playground, the arena, the card table, the magic circle, the temple, the stage, the screen, the tennis court, the court of justice, etc., are all in form and function playgrounds, i.e. forbidden spots, isolated, hedged round, hallowed, within which special rules obtain. All are temporary worlds within the ordinary world, dedicated to the performance an act apart. I think that's absolutely wonderful, um, and I, I think it's a, it's a strange sign of our times that all that's been kind of forgotten. Within, okay, the, the, the last little point is this. Okay, I, I want to make another more technical point, but it's easy to understand about um, about uh, costly signal theory, and um, maybe maybe it's best done with um, a bit of. Kind of gesture, I suppose you could call it. Anyway, here is a 20 pound note. I don't have a 10 pound note, do I? <laughs> right. Minimum note. No. Now, this is quite costly to print. If you try forging it, you'll have, you know, you need a very good printing machine. And it can be done, but it's 
you know, difficult to do quite as well as these people do. And just think about the components of cost and a thing like that. How much does it cost to signify that this is £20 and not £10? I mean, everyone's played Monopoly. You lose a bit of money, maybe you haven't got the right money. You just get some bits of paper and you just say, right, £200, £1,000, £50, you do it as a ballpoint. And you've made your point. You've made the, the, the distinction between 20 and 100 or 20 and 10 very, very clear with a simple felt tip pen or whatever. Doesn't do anything. Right. How much cost does it, how much investment and cost and effort and time does it take to prove that this isn't, that I didn't print this myself? <laughs> a vast amount. You know, the hologram, the bit of metal, the special paper, the strips, uh, the watermark. I mean, about 99% of the cost of this, I mean, more than 99%, is going into proving that it's not a fake, right? So, Menard Smith had this wonderful idea. He said, why don't we take animal signals and divide up the component of cost? How much cost is going into what he called this um, reliability, not proving it's not a forgery, and he called that the strategic cost, and how much of the cost goes into what he calls efficacy, distinguishing between this signal and that, between that like between 10 and 20. Well, in the case of animal signaling, to be honest, 95% of the pantu is proving that it's for real. How much is proving that it's not a laugh or not a, I don't know, not a copulation squeal or what, some other damn thing? I mean, hard, it's just so obvious you don't have to put any effort into that. Now, if you had, so and he, what, this, what he's saying what, to Harvey and everyone's more or less on the same page with these costly signals. There used to be lots of different arguments about costly signals. I think everyone's more or less settled down now. A very small number of exceptions apart would go into that. Um, what people now realise is that um, the reason for the strategic component, the watermarks if you like, is that people won't accept this stuff on faith. I mean, people need to know, even now you're just going to shock people from that put a little blue pen over it, and think, I think, I don't know, I always feel a bit cross, don't you? Why do you think I would have printed it myself? I mean, it's just I'm looking at it like that, and all that stuff, running it up. So... They do it downstairs, don't they? They do it downstairs, and it's even worse! Okay. <laughs> so, can you see what's happening? You nobody just say to, that, nobody wants to just accept. Up. Nobody wants to accept a fifty-pound note because it looks roughly like one. You want to know it really is a fifty-pound note. So the huge <laughs> amount of cost goes into producing it. And see, with animals, no animal wants to just say, "Oh right, okay, yes, the, the you know the food's over there, the femur's over there, the leopard over there." They want to know, so that the, they, they drive the signaler to produce watermarks and holograms, rooting the signal in things which can't be fake, namely your body and your emotions, which are very hard to fake. Humans are extraordinarily good at faking. I mean, we are the world's supreme liars. I mean, the, you go to a drama school, you can, you can put the whole of the drama school curriculum into one sentence almost. It's like, um, it's like the public really values sincerity. You can fake that, you're married. Okay? So humans are brilliant at faking sincerity, faking stuff. Now, what, 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 just get back to Elon Smith. Supposing you had enough trust to just completely get rid of the watermarks and the, and the holograms. Well, we do that when we play Monopoly, don't we? we t I, mean, I think we trust each other. In my family, we're both very trusting, but we sort of trusted each other enough as we were kids to understand that you just write £100 on a piece of Monopoly paper, it's £100, you know? So what happens if you do that? You've got, it's, like, it's like you've got infinite trust. There's no one's going to want to, there's no, nothing to be gained in, I don't know, in the play monopoly, either, picking money from under the table that you've written yourself or something. Maybe there is, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there is, though, because that's easy. really fun. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually anyway, drunk. Well, all I'm saying, let's just say, let's just say, in order to, in, it's, a, it's a simple logical point, in order to reduce the strategic cost to zero, the trust has to go up to infinity, mathematically speaking. Infinite trust? What animal will want? I mean, even us, I don't have infinite trust in anyone. I have quite a lot of trust. But, <laughs> but infinite on. trust within, a, within, let's pretend, within a lie, if you like, within a shared lie. In other words, my signals are just telling you what I'm thinking. And, uh, you know, that's, that's conceivable. It's a bit like, it's a, it's a bit like again, getting back to the, to the chess metaphor, when um, Ferdinand is so sure, but Wittgenstein has the same thing. He, 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 it's like, um, the, he, you're playing chess. Um, 
and you, you, you trust each other sufficiently to stick to the rules. And when you're playing chess, you don't need to shove your bishop forward you know, with a lot of effort. You just need to put it across the square, and all the, all the other player needs to know is it's supposed to be on this square or that square. Can you see what I'm saying? You may not trust the other person's... You, you kind of do, but you, you think, oh, right, what's he up to now? Well, this really clever Machiavellian trick. I think oh, he's going to get me checkmate in two moves. All that stuff is going on. But each move you trust. How could you not trust? I mean, you trust that that's a bishop. It's not really a queen in disguise or whatever. And this really is on that square. It's not some other square. I mean, you couldn't even begin to play the game unless you had that infinite trust on that level. Language is like that. We have infinite trust that, 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 that you meant to say pin, not bin. You meant to say you're going to eat us rather than meet us. Whatever it is, <laughs> okay. On that level, the trust is so, so high that we can do this amazing stuff. Mm. Chimpanzees wouldn't even get there. When a chimpanzee starts to... I mean, all oh, right, so that is my way of putting it. In, in the animal world with vocal communication, you, the animal is just about to produce a sound. And it's as if the listener already, at the very beginning of that sequence of sounds, wants to know that it's true. So you say, Hoo. Is it true? Hoo. You say it again. The listener wants to know, Hoo, 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 hoo. You keep saying it because you're trying to prove that it's true. You're not allowed to say something which is patently untrue and then another patently untrue thing, and, another, and then and they, you're giving the listener some kind of vision of imaginings in your head. But humans have got enough trust through, thanks to the revolution, which was a sexual as well as a political revolution, to allow each other to tell lies. Um, they're kind of lies. A metaphor, literally, is a false statement. You know, Juliet is the sun. No. The sun is a great big ball of hot gases in the sky. Julie is not a great big ball of hot gases in the sky. John is a pig. We often say that. Aren't we? When, I say, when I say John is a pig, I actually mean it. He's a pig. He actually is a pig. I don't want to feel like swearing. Uh, but I don't mean he's got a curly tail, or he's got hooves, or he lives in a... I don't, the thing I'm trying to make is greedy, he's gross, all that stuff. So you're saying things that are untrue, but the listener knows what you mean. And we're prepared with each other to get behind the untruths to the underlying intention. No other animal was able to do that. That's why we have language in other creatures. But is there a problem with um, ritual in religion that it actually, it's a, it's a different quality because you're told that it is actually true? Yeah. That That's very important. That's a really important point. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and what I think most anthropologists, for one another, would say is that. Religion, in the sense we mean it, is, um, is coercive metaphor. So with a, with, a, with a collective coercive metaphor, you actually say, this piece of bread is the flesh of Jesus. This wine is the blood. And you, it isn't, it isn't like, it's been, it would be hopeless to say, this is rather like the blood of Jesus, or this is rather like the blood of Jesus. <laughs> or this is, uh, this, is what, this, is what, this is what the Protestants, sorry, what the Catholics, so, well, sorry, the other way around. That the Catholics actually consisted in doing the Reformation or whatever. This it's not symbolic of Jesus' blood. It is, you know. It's a, and, and with metaphor, we, we, when we use metaphor, we always mean it. When I say John's a pig or he's a, whoever is a pig, I, I mean it. But not to that extent, though. But uh, all the details aren't filled in. So uh, lots of details about pigs I don't really care about. <laughs> Curly tail and so on. <laughs> okay. But but uh, to cut a long story short, we are so trusting we can tell each other lies. And if you, if you, uh, kind of lies, honest lies, if you like, honest fakes, <laughs> fake lies with, you know, good intent, rather like the, I was saying, with the, you remember the bite? It's a, it's a bite, but intended positively. We give lies to each other, but they're intended positively. And we they're flexible lies. And they're flexible lies. Well, we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't, and by the way, not just, I'm going to need to stop now, we almost stop while we are running out of time. But all of... All of language, all of grammar, even the formal structure of language, the, the duality of patterning, all the, all the funny, all the digital structure, everything, if we, it all comes out of metaphor. If we couldn't use metaphor, if we didn't feel liberated to tell lies to each other, like stories, fairy stories, myths, you know, it, we, we wouldn't have language. But can you see how much trust that involves? And, and it, it, the amount of trust required actually goes beyond anything you could ever find in a Darwinian social world. Darwinism is about competition, animals do cooperate uh, up to a point, but the level of cooperation required to get the, the trust needed to permit metaphor is just off the scale. And
we need to we need uh, to end up maybe just say language is revolutionary. It emerged in a revolution, and that revolution was social. So I agree with Engels about the tools, um, but it was more than that. Language is the product of social revolution. The very fact that we've got language today, we're all talking to each other, and Abel's talking to each other, is the greatest evidence there ever was that revolution works. Thank you. <clears throat>